This week on the Baseline Podcast, Josh and I talk about his amazing birthday that also involved his North Carolina Tar Heels beating their arch rival, Duke, to go on to the national title game to face Kansas. We talk about the ins and outs of the game. We talk about the key players. We talk about predictions for the national title game. And then we move on to baseball because it is baseball week this week because opening day is right around the corner. We talk about our preseason award favorites as well as who we think will win the World Series. All that and so much more coming up on the Baseline Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Baseline Podcast. I'm Ben. There's Josh. And we are here to talk about some sports. Uh, Some crazy things have been happening in sports lately. Uh, But more importantly, Josh celebrated his birthday, which was on Saturday. We record this on Sunday. So a couple days ago when you're listening. But Josh had a great birthday. I think Josh had one of the greatest birthdays as a sports fan that you can have. So Josh, how did your birthday go? And like, what is this like the best birthday you've had? So it already was a solid day because my parents came out from Ohio to uh, visit me out in Indiana. Uh, Some of my friends from my church out here uh, all got together and we hung out for a while uh, in the evening. Uh, And we're watching the March Madness basketball games, which were the final four was happening on my birthday. And to my surprise but also delight my North Carolina Tar Heels defeated Duke and are going to the national championship game Ben I did not see this coming you saw me last week I picked Duke to win that game and to continue to go on and win it all in Coach K's last season but I'll tell you one thing this if anything proves that the tournaments aren't rigged now because you wouldn't take Coach K the alleged greatest coach of all time and make him lose his last two games to Carolina one of them being his last home game, but the other being his last tournament game. He uh, can't go out like that if it's rigged. So hey. this was all Carolina talent, man. And we are going to continue this momentum and we're going to take it to Kansas. Hey, all I know is, is that I called it last week when you both looked at me like I was the weirdest guy on earth. And I said, it just didn't I'm seem like calling this a possibility. Yeah, but- I called it. And Jamie, Jamie, just poor choice of words on an Instagram Instagram story. That's all I'm going to say. I, it's, I, Jamie, yeah. you cut the gun a little early there before you really could. She did wish me a happy birthday uh, with an Instagram story, but also wished uh, the biggest of UNC losses for me. And I, I messaged her on that. I was like, I'm going to throw this on my story after we win. And she like sent a bunch of laughing, crying emojis. And then the Tar Heels won and I had to do it. It's like, I just kind of was saying as a joke, because I've been trash talking Duke all week. Uh Duke fans that I know and then just throwing stuff on my Instagram stories about like goofy things that Duke fans do and stuff like that but I mean what a game Ben have you gotten it, to watch it I was probably happening at 2 a.m your time dude, it right? was it was late I I woke up and watched some of the highlights this morning I, I watched most of the game so like the cool thing is March Madness has been doing on YouTube they basically take all the game and they shrink it down really really short so I could watch it right because I was good like I asked I asked at church this morning like literally like first thing I walk in and the guy was one of my, uh, one of our good friends at church was like, Hey, you, I'm surprised you're here. Didn't you watch the games yesterday? I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean, like if it was a high state, yeah, I think it was like one of those things where one, I had just had a long week, but then two, I did check it. And I'll be honest that that game will go down as one of the, probably one of the most, I think in my time, like just watching it, like one of those games that I'll remember for a really long time, partly because of Coach K's, you know, last game. Mm-hmm. We'll 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 touch on that in a second. There's a lot riding on that game, but and but I think I even like, yeah, but I think even too on that. Not just that there was a lot riding on it. I think it was the fact that it almost felt like everyone was like, "Oh, it has to be a Coach K victory," and I think that's what made it so interesting because you had a North Carolina team was like, "Hey, wait, hold up," like you know, uh, you know, it's it's like one of those things where it's like an underdog, but they felt like more of an underdog. It's like, okay, we beat them once at home. Why can't we do it again in a final four? Right. So that's what made it really cool. And then I I did watch, I didn't really, I caught some of the highlights of the Kansas game, but honestly, that game was just a blowout. So I really just was like after a while, but yes, it would have been really early in the morning. And so I'm debating on how the national title game is going to go because I have to teach the next day. But my dad told me, and I actually thought about this because it's so late that actually when I wake up in the morning, I'll catch the ending of the game because that's how early I get up. So I'm actually going to be like crossing paths with the game, which will be kind of funny. But but yeah, yeah. so so yeah, th- that's that's my thoughts. I, I again, I think it's one of the greatest games that 
probably that it it's was. probably going to be one of the greatest rivalry. Like with as hyped as the game was, my biggest fear was uh, as a fan of either side would have been the game not living up to the hype, like it being a blowout one way or another, or, you know, the game goes to the ref's hands or something like that. And then it just ends up not being, uh, you know, the greatest uh, college basketball rivalry game that you could imagine. But I like the, the, I think it was Clark Kellogg said it after the game, uh, there wasn't anyone that lost this game tonight. There was just the team that won it. And yeah. it was Carolina. And it's like, I mean, Duke, I mean, played a heck of a game. I mean, they did. I can't remember who it was, but uh, that one guy, I think it was number 15, missed two free throws at the end that were kind of important. There was a three-pointer that R.J. Davis had in the first half that was initially called a two, switched to a three, so that kind of helped solve things at that end. But there was also an 11-0 run that Carolina went on, Ben, really early in the second yeah. half to take the lead back from Duke. I think Duke led by three at the half that that uh that run that Carolina had ended up being pretty huge and then once again late in the game who's coming up clutch with dagger threes it's Caleb Love it's incredible like this Carolina team it, the, another thing about the first half too Brady Manick I think he only made one shot didn't have a three yet he starts hitting shots in the second half and I mean it's just like all hands are on deck now so it's like dude watch we, out, man. this kind of dangerous I said he was the x factor I said that I oh, said yeah. that last week we both I was with touched you, man. On it's it. like when he's hitting threes this team seems to just which he doesn't go. look like if you look at him he's like not a guy you look like he should be hitting threes he looks like he a looks guy like that should a be guy underneath should be pine trees down in the woods yes. <laughs> and she just beating the snot out of people no but I will say you know you know love was feeling the love last I'm sorry that was a terrible dad joke um but no you know what, I, and all the all the broadcasters you know can't resist those kind of jokes either though so you're not the only one well that's good i'm not the only one um what would you say josh i mean you you look at this game right and i think we all i mean outside of me you know last week both of you were like very like duke's just gonna win this game it's kind of like it makes sense we talk about the coach k thing right and we talked about before we got on air here we were we were discussing this before we came on to record and we both kind of had a similar reaction because if this is this is kind of interesting, right? Duke loses in the postseason, and supposedly this was Coach K's last year, supposedly. But we also know there's a quarterback in the NFL that also said, "Hey, I'm I'm gonna gonna hang it up," and then a few weeks later says, "Eh, I want to come back." So my question to you, Josh, is. Is this the end of Coach K, or has this just been a big old ploy of Coach K, or is Coach K like, hey, I'm not done yet? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because unlike Tom Brady, Coach K tabbed at the end, I think, of last season that this season would be his first. So we've known this for a pretty long time, whereas Brady's was kind of like, I don't want to call it a surprise since he was old, but it was just kind of like we didn't know that that was going to be his last year until the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is just kind of a – uh, maybe Coach K has been kind of at peace with this being his last season with whatever happens. Maybe he's pondered this for a little while longer and it wasn't just like, you know, a decision that he made after, yeah. you know, after his, what would be his last season. They've also tabbed John Shire, I believe, as the next head yeah. coach, yeah, yeah, like yeah. coaching waiting. But again, Coach K hasn't officially retired yet. So I don't know. I mean, it, other people have been saying that uh, maybe this means that he's going to come back again, but I think just since he's kind of already been moving towards this direction of getting yeah. out of coaching, that that is probably going to be it for him. Well, I think even you look at the the way he's had the farewell tour, like how could you look at all those schools and go, hey, thanks for all the gifts. Um, yeah. I'm not retiring, but thank you for the gifts. I appreciate it. Um, you have to do this again next year. You know, like that's the all the other thing, right? Like, again, this is just like, you know, Josh and I messing around the fact that we think, but I think we both in our, in our own minds kind of think this, it has to be, if me, even if he doesn't want to, it's kind of like, why would you then go back on like a whole year of, of teams? Like Ohio state did it like a whole bunch of teams, you know, gave him gifts and said, Hey, like, this is to recognize, you know, the goat, you know, the greatest of all time. And I, I feel like it'd be really weird. It, like you said, it wasn't like Tom Brady who kind of out of nowhere in a sense said, Hey, I'm retiring. This is coach K thinking all year, like all year he could have came back on it and said, Hey, I'm going to, 
continue after next year. Right. Like Kobe Bryant too said that his last season was going to be his last season too, before it started. Yeah, so exactly. He Kobe farewell tour and everybody was paying ridiculous prices to get to his games and stuff like that. So I think this was more of a premeditated move, if you will. And he's, it is going to be his last one. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, I think we both can say that like, you know, even the outcome, like I know you're super excited for North Carolina, being a North Carolina fan and seeing North Carolina in the title game. I think it's awesome. It's like their 12th, uh, 12th championship game, which is second all time, which is uh, just amazing. What, but you do have to agree though. I mean, I, I think we both can like coach K is the greatest coach of all time, at least in college basketball ranks. Like John, I, John Wooden's up there. And I, I, I I was debating this earlier today. Like if we look at the college ranks, like there's a couple coaches I could put up there, but I don't know. Coach K, the, what, what he's done and the, the length that he's done it, it, it's, it's hard for me to go like any, if there's anybody else better than him, you know? Yeah. I mean, wooden winning, I think it was 11 total championships yeah, so eight in a row. I mean, no doubt the best of his day. I think coach K has got to be one of the best of his day as well. Do you think it's like, um, do you think it's like a LeBron versus Michael kind of same debate, like two different eras? You can't really compare the two. Maybe a little bit of that. It's uh, they're coaching a different style of basketball, but yeah. since coach K has been doing it for so long, like he's had to coach through a lot of different, uh, yeah. I guess, eras, like how many coaches, like old coaches, I guess, like I even look, compare this to North Carolina, Roy Williams, North Carolina's coach before Hubert Davis always would bring guys in to Carolina that were going to be like two year guys, three year guys, four year guys. He never really brought in any kind of one and done talents. And Coach K has gone from an era where like everybody played all four years to now he's like recruiting in a way where you can get like all these kind of one and done kids. Like when he got the top three recruits in the country, Zion, RJ, it was and ridiculous. Reddish. Yeah. Like he's been able to adjust to that style of recruiting that John Calipari uh, over at Kentucky, I guess has kind of made the, the new wave of college basketball. Like that, if you're going to like compete year in and year out, you got to do it like one and done, but Carolina, I mean, they, they've never really recruited that way. Um, so maybe that's why they aren't like, necessarily getting high rankings like one and two seeds consistently uh, well i shouldn't even say that because i mean they've been in the final four several yeah. times lately of their own like they do really well with what they do but they aren't bringing like i guess the hyped up players you know what i mean like yeah. they're being led by juniors some sophomores whereas uh and i don't know off the top of my head if this is duke's team this year in particular but coach k has found ways to bring in the top freshman I mean, you got banchero i mean you got banchero who's you know arguably the best player in um yeah in, in so coach basketball. k's been able to evolve i guess through eras like it wasn't like a new era of one and done recruiting came and it knocked him out because he couldn't adjust so. yeah and i and that's why i think that he is one of the greatest if not the greatest of all time because to adapt the way he's done it i, I think it's it's awesome to see but i think it's also like he also won three gold medals by the way like as a coach so the fact that he went from college basketball coaching kids to saying oh i'm going to take on the nba's greatest and now i'm going to go in and win gold medals like that that to me shows a coach that can do anything and can coach anybody he can coach lebron james to you know seth curry right like he can choose any any range of person he can coach and that that shows that he has that respect and i think people talk really um, highly yeah, yeah. about that 08 team that he uh coached to to a gold medal because yeah. he had a lot of uh i guess more individual focused players like dwight howard and kobe bryant Dwayne wade LeBron. Carmelo, and lebron james all playing team basketball that year whereas i mean it's tough for any kind of nba coach to do that i mean we see the brooklyn nets with uh, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, that should be a no doubt NBA championship contender, and right? Not. <laughs> they didn't even last the season together, <laughs> and they and like you said, even when they were playing together, they weren't like the way that he was able to coach those guys and get them to play team basketball was incredible. Yeah, it is, and I think and I think you agree with me on this. It's going to be really hard to find another coach like Coach K. Like I think it's going to be really hard to go and go. Is there going to be someone that's going to last that long, right? Because most of these coaches now, and you can agree with me, most of these coaches are done by their forty-five, fifty. They're going to ESPN, they're going to Fox, they're going to all these other places to make more money outside of coaching or athletic director, right? The, a lot of the coaches. I mean, you look at uh, Bob Huggins, who's been around forever. You look at you know Roy Williams when he was around. Like these guys that last a long time, it's because they're willing to adapt. I think some coaches, when things change, they kind of go, hey, I'm going to go make the, you know, the millions of dollars I can to be in front of the TV. Um, 
you know, and Dick Vitale and, and those guys, they do a great job and all the coaches that join that, that crew, I'm not saying that's a, whatever, you know, that's them, but I'm saying the best coaches are the ones that are willing to adapt, you know, not run away from, from that. I'm not saying everyone's running away, but the fact that people are going for bigger money too. Um, and that's, I think, what would you say it, for you, for you as a North Carolina fan, do you, do you think, do you think it would have been even more special if it was like, Roy Williams versus coach K like both their last game. I think that would have been, that would have been the coolest thing ever. If, if, if Roy and it would have felt, it would have felt good. I think, uh, Hubert, I mean, no disrespect to Hubert, but I mean, Roy is a North Carolina legend. I believe the court says Roy Williams court. Yes. <laughs> we're at Chapel Hill, but it does kind of make it more special in a way because maybe this, uh, is going to create some optimism for what's to come from coach yeah. David now, because I mean, this is his first season and he's beating Duke in Coach K's last season, taking North Carolina as an eight seed of the national championship game. Uh, so maybe, maybe in terms of history, like if it was Roy's last season and Coach K's last season, that would have just added, I guess, to the storyline. The tickets but, would have been worth like you know a hundred thousand dollars. It would have seemed yeah. like. Yeah, and I was looking. I was looking. I mean, the tickets, the cheapest ones, were going for like three, four hundred dollars, which is a little lower than what I was anticipating. I'm kind yeah. of disappointed that they were that affordable to get in. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it was still high. Still high. To high price ticket to get in like i think then most final fours like the national championship tickets ben are, you can get in for less than 100 bucks the only problem oh. is a flight to new orleans is like 1500 dollars right now from like all 1500 the yeah it costs it costs 1800 to get here to hungary from where you're at how right. in the world does and it this, cost 1500 to go to new orleans it, That's i think beyond. the airlines are just all capitalizing on uh the opportunity they're like a lot of people from you know, North Carolina, a lot of people from Kansas and just college basketball fans from everywhere are trying to get to the game. And while the game ticket itself is affordable, getting there, I mean, all, all the airlines, I think, are taking advantage because it's never $1,500 yeah. to fly domestically in the States. And it's really funny because I, I was thinking about Coach Estep, right? Like, I always was jealous because every Final Four, he gets to go to, like, the games. And I'm like, what a game because he was at the game. I saw him post a picture. So, like, that to me was be like, oh to go there and like, because you're a coach and you, you get the opportunity and stuff like that's, that's really cool. Um, but we also had another game go on, which was more, not disappointing. Huh? What yeah. Games? Yeah. There was another game, you know, it was like Villanova, Kansas. It was more disappointing than I thought it would be. I think part of it is, game that before the varsity one, you mean? <laughs> yeah, it was the JV I'm kidding, game. Kansas fans. Yes. I'm sorry. Kidding. Sorry. Villanova fans. I mean, I will say I feel bad for Villanova because they lost their best player, pretty like not their best player one of their best players right and that team looked nothing like the team that beat Ohio State they like, came out flat they came out dude, flat oh. I think down 13 to 2 to start and I mean that that's kind of the story there because what Kansas ended up winning by like 15 they just yeah. basically maintained that lead the rest of the game Nova was never really able and, and you what's and what's funny if I look back at the beginning of this this basketball season no one talked about Kansas that's what's so funny no one talked about them really. They talked about Baylor out of the Big 12. They talked about all these other teams. Kansas, I never heard any of the big, you know, ESPN or anything really talk about Kansas until the NCAA tournament. It was so funny to me. Like, oh, we're just going to count out Kansas because, well, it's not the same old Kansas. And it's like, well, I'm pretty sure same coach. Pretty sure, yep, still about the same kind of, you know, team, the way the team operates, right? Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on Kansas as someone who who watched that game, like I, I think it will be a very competitive game, just like the Duke North Carolina game is. I, I'm interested to see what 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 are your thoughts as we preview this this game for uh, would be either tonight when you're listening to this, or it's already happened, and our preview right now is going to be either completely right or completely wrong. So you can we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. So last night was actually the first time that I've seen Kansas this whole tournament. I want to say because I've been so laser focused on making vacation. sure that the games that I do get to watch are the Carolina ones. So and vacation. And I was on vacation. Yes. Yeah, so I did miss uh, a couple <laughs> a couple days of or I mean a couple opportunities to be able to watch Kansas in action. But uh, I wonder if uh, some of that lack of hype for Kansas is just because since they are kind of good every year, it's just kind of understood yeah. and boring to 
predict Kansas to win because it's almost like the cliche pick, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, you're going to say that the New England Patriots with Tom Brady are going to win the Super Bowl this year. How original, you know, what a hot take that is. And people and Baylor, I mean, they were the national champion last year, yep. right? So popular pick to repeat. Uh, Texas uh, had a new coach, Chris Beard, I believe this year. So yep. hot, hot pick right there if you want to go that route. And Kansas is just kind of one of those teams that's like, yeah, they'll be in the mix, but they also haven't won a national championship since I want to say, was it 2008 with Mario Chalmers? Yeah, it was, I, I'm pretty sure that was the last one. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so, so, I mean, it's a, it's a, maybe a little bit more recent than some of the other teams that uh, we see that are winning year in and year out. Definitely more, definitely more recent more. than Ohio State. Ohio yeah. State last one in 1960, so it's it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, Kansas – I mean, Kansas had a couple close calls too. What was it? Uh, was it Texas Tech that they were losing to at the I half? Th- think – yeah, that was Texas Tech. I'm pretty sure it was Texas Tech because they were losing like by – I remember because I was calling my dad at the time and they were like losing by six or something like that or seven – at mm-hmm. halftime and then my dad was like then i called him a little bit later and he's like he's like yeah it's like kansas like woke up it's like coach went in there and said yeah y'all are about to blow your chances here <laughs> and then didn't kansas uh elite eight against miami they were trailing at the half as well and then miami only scored 15 points in the second half because they were missing a couple of their guys yeah because they played yeah because they played my no it was miami they were losing to miami they were losing to That's texas tech losing. is another team that yeah. i think played, or maybe that was duke Gosh, I got to check that, Ben. I can't be telling lies on this show. I know. I know. Well, I do know they were losing to Miami, though. They were losing to them Miami, by, like, they definitely did play. Yeah, like Miami seven or eight. Looking, I think it was, yeah, that's Miami was, was playing so good. Which and I would have been cool to see, too. I would have loved to see a Miami-North Carolina <laughs> final. Wouldn't that have been entertaining? Yeah. Like, by the way, while we're talking about college basketball, while I'm trying to pull up these scores, I want to point out how wrong I was about the women's Final Four picking – I think I said Stanford. Dude, last you weekend. you just that definitely didn't happen. Dude, guess who guess who I picked? Oh wait. <laughs> I picked Yukon. Shocker and they made it. Cause that's Does what happened. Like help you win brownie points with your wife now that you've gotten a no. couple, of, right? No. No. You can't say that too loud. I don't want her to hear, you know, because uh-huh. her being she's already she's already beat me, I'm pretty sure, by a by a little bit. So Okay. Okay. It must have been well. Okay, yeah, it must have been Duke or something that was trailing can't to Texas Tech because they haven't they've only well Kansas has faced Texas Southern, Creighton, Providence, and Miami. Yeah, the Miami is the game. Know that Carolina has had a little tougher of a road to go because last week when we were talking about the seeds of all the combined opponents, like yeah. Kansas was like thirty nine, Carolina's twenty nine. Now they've both played two seeds, so it's the same. So Carolina's a little bit more battle tested. <laughs> But, I mean, it's the tournament. Everybody, if you're in a national championship game, you deserve to be here. You're one of the best teams in the country. Yeah, and, like, and this is where I always say, like, you know, it, you know, people are always going to say, like, let's say North Carolina goes out and wins this game, right? People are going to say for weeks on weeks end, like, oh, they weren't the best team. They just got a blessing in the road. It's like, no, you go out and win a national title, you're the best team that year. It doesn't matter what your record says. It doesn't matter. It's who you beat. And you beat the teams that were in front of you. And – and you're the best. And I think that's what b- drove me nuts about when I played in high school or stuff like that. And like, you'd beat a team that, you know, that you weren't supposed to beat and you're, you win the league that year. And they're like, Oh, well, you weren't the best team in the league. And it's like, wait, I'm pretty sure first means like you're the best. That's normally how it works. Right. But again, we are in the 21st century. First is the worst. Second is the best. Yeah. Sorry. We're in the 21st century, Josh. We got to be careful. You know, we're not first doesn't mean you're the best anymore. You know, we're all volunteer winners. Um, but uh, that, I'm not going to get political on this. This is not my political <laughs> channel. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so we, so I preview this game, right? Kansas, North Carolina. I think it's going to be one of those games that uh, last week I went low balling on the scores, like, which I was right about Villanova. I said 50 something for Villanova and they, <laughs> they scored 50 something. Um, they lost though. Um, so yeah. that was one out of two so jamie was oh out of two euro i two. switched my pick i had initially had kansas in my bracket and i was like but you know what i think nova is kind of riding on some momentum here and i'm gonna switch my pick to nova man <laughs> we, we 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 got you gullible that's what we did yeah we got you gullible yeah. um you can so i was one for two so i won out of last week i just want to let jamie know jamie just like what celebrity we beat you. Um, oh. uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Mechanics works beat West Liberty more times than not. So I should probably shut up at this point. Um, but anyways, we're back to the real stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think this game is going to be interesting, right? Like I think Kansas is a team that is, I showed last night that 
you know, when they put their whole team together and when they, you know, it did help that Villanova was at, had a rough start, but I think North Carolina, I, to be honest, I look at this game and go, this is another game where North Carolina is going to walk in and feel like they're not the best, right? Like that's, that's what this game seems like. And I think this is the time where North Carolina needs to say, you know, Hubert, Hubert <laughs> needs to go in there and go, Hey, uh, you remember when we kept saying that everyone thought we were underdogs? Yeah. This is another game where we're an underdog. Um, but yeah, I think it's gonna be a great game. Um, I think Kansas has always coached well, I think all the way through, they always have been. Um, so what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I, I'm kind of like, I'm still trying to figure out how I really feel about the game, but what about you? Yeah, I think Carolina's kind of been thriving off of the underdog mentality because it's really brought us into a situation where we aren't facing any pressure. There wasn't pressure to beat number one Baylor, right? Mm -hmm. Like as an underdog, there wasn't pressure to, I mean, this is, it is an underdog, but St. Peter's, like, just yeah. beat the 15th. Like, there wasn't much pressure there. Uh, you get to Duke, right? And Coach K is supposed to win that game. They're the two seed. He's supposed to win his last tournament game. So, really, in that game, all the pressure I felt like was on Duke. And in this game, again, against Kansas, we are the lower seed once again. But this would be my only concern, Ben, with the Tar Heels. And I don't think it'll happen because they're a veteran group. But is it possible that they treat Saturday getting that win over Duke in the final four as the national championship and then yeah. don't play as hard Monday and kind of are running off of, I guess, the hype and the thrill of the final four win. And then they, they come up and are a little flat against Kansas maybe, but two seniors, two or one junior, two sophomores, like it's an upper class team. It's a disciplined team. That's been uh, yeah beating teams that they haven't aren't supposed to be really at this point so I don't think that'll be a problem but I guess as a Tar Heel fan that's my only concern going in here is that uh they're riding off of uh, I guess the thrill of defeating Duke and then they don't show up maybe and play their best you know and I and that almost reminds me of the Ohio State Final Four run when they made the national title in 20, 2007 it, it really does because I think a high as a high State fans is our first national title game since 19 19- 60 right like it was the first time we've been in the final four it was the first time since like i don't even remember when it was the last time we were in the final four before that year right and thad mata got there which by the way uh as you're watching, thad mata has got another coaching job now just yeah. with butler so just so everyone knows like anybody cares but anyways I, I the reason why i'm relating that to the north carolina thing is because i think ohio state was in the same boat like as fans especially like, yeah, we want we are national title sweep. We're going to win this. And as a high state fans, we're always looking forward to that. But I think in some cases we were like, wow, we finally made it back to the big stage. We beat, we beat a team that like Ohio state was very talented, but like, they were like, Oh, it's a football school. That's what they were hearing this whole time. They're a football school, football school. So yeah, I, I that's what it kind of reminds me of. Or even like in high school, like I always think of high school, like when you beat a team that, um, you weren't supposed to beat and that becomes like your game. And then the next game, you know, you get blown out or the next game you're like, yeah, don't get anything because you you've hyped yourself up so much for that game and they end up losing. Cause you know, like a high state, I'm getting destroyed by Florida, which in both football and basketball, which was humiliating as a high state fan. Same year, yeah. Uh, it was awful. Um, but yeah, so that that's, that's my thoughts. I think on it, I think if you're Kansas though, too, I think you also have to be looking at North Carolina as like, they're not an eight seed. I think that's very hard I with think players. That's been pretty proven. Like I thought, eight seed was low for Carolina. I thought they deserved like maybe a six, but they're playing yeah. way better than an eight. Yeah, and I, I've always believed. You look at their record. I'm like, I don't know how they're an eight when you have Michigan sitting there at an eleven. Eight and eleven is not too far off, and you have Michigan who had lost what 13, 14 games. They lost fifteen games, and they had an eleven seed. Yeah, that's they, that's where there's it's a little really close been to, to begin with, as we've talked about yes, but, multiple times. Yeah. And I want to say, too, that we've even seen I think Kansas one year had a two seed when they had nine losses as well, like Carolina. So yeah, that, that's that's the nuts part. Right. And I, I think, think it was just I think it was just the inconsistent play of Carolina throughout the regular season and then kind of uh, the disappointing finish in the ACC tournament that yeah. maybe there's recency bias and the people that voted on the polls were like, yeah, these guys. Well, because you look like at the ACC. You look at the ACC, right? And they were like, you look, they, everyone said the Big Ten was going to have possibly two teams in the final four, and the Big Ten didn't have anybody. 
the Big Ten had the most teams. They had nine teams get it selected, and it was like the Big Ten just decided to drop a big old poop shell right there, and and there's just like why, why? But so yeah, I think Kansas. That's the thing they got to watch out for, right? Is going into this game and and being very, very nearsighted and and getting caught up in that. But before, so obviously it's gonna be a big game. Uh, you're gonna be watching it. I will watch the ending when I wake up at f- four forty five, five o'clock in the morning. Um, but uh, it's gonna be a great game. What is our predictions? Here on the Baseline Podcast, we love to give predictions that are normally 100% wrong, um, <laughs> but we like to give our predictions. So I, I'm going to let the guy who has the most in stake here at, in this game, I think I can say that, uh, I'm going to let you go with this. What's going to happen? Ben, I am not going to pick against the Tar Heels anymore the rest of this tournament. You're listening to me. Wow. <laughs> I'm not picking against the Tar Heels anymore this tournament, which isn't saying much because there's only one game left. But not that I have doubted Carolina. I did not expect them to beat Baylor. I did expect them to win. Actually, I don't even think I expect them to beat UCLA either. No. So, and I didn't expect them to beat Duke. They just keep surprising me. I'm a fan. I try to be realistic. So I'm not like unrealistic and disappoint myself and become that fan. But now that we're here, I'm not going to pick against them anymore, Ben. The Tar Heels are winning this thing. I think the lowest seed to ever win the national tournament is an eight seed, and this would tie it. We're going Carolina. Ooh, what, what's your score prediction? Got Carolina, what's your score prediction? Yeah, uh, score prediction. Uh, Carolina's had uh, some relatively high-scoring games, so I don't think this is going to be, uh, you know, one year 60 to 50s or anything like that. I think we might see a Carolina 85, Kansas maybe 77, and that'll just be because of free throws at the end of the game. Ooh. I like it. Well, as you all know, I want to say this again, just so everyone, especially Jamie and Josh can hear this. I was the only one to pick North Carolina to win last week to prove that I am the superior species um, on this, on this, this podcast. Uh, No, in all all seriousness, I, uh, so I was thinking about this, right? Like, do I go North Carolina eight seed? Do I continue with believing in the Tar Heels, even though I really don't give a rat's rip about this game at all? Um, do or do I go with Kansas, the Jayhawks? I still haven't figured out what a Jayhawk is in how many years of watching Kansas. They have the coolest chant though in a in an arena. Just gonna say that it's it's pretty cool. Uh, so where, where do I go? Right. So I was thinking, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna stick with the Tar Heels. There's the two weirdest names mascots in sports: the Jayhawk and the Tar Heel. But you know what? I got to go North Carolina. There's just something about me that loves an underdog story. I rooted for Butler when they made that run back in 2011. I rooted for, um, I rooted for you know St. Peter's all the way up through. There's just something about an eight seed going in against a one seed, and and even though it is two blue bloods of the sport, to just see an eight seed win would be really cool. But also, I think North Carolina has the talent to do it. I think Kansas has had a, a weaker run. I hate to say that, but because it's been a hard run to get here, but I think out of the two. Um, and I and I have my uh, my man, uh, Manic, right? That's his name, right? With the Brady red Manic. Hand. Yeah, that's my dude. And I think that he's going to knock down some threes because us tall guys yeah. got to knock threes down. And I think Tall, that, lanky, white guy. I feel like you guys got a little bit in dude. common, and we need to support those guys. Absolutely. Tall, lanky, and white. That's what we got to do. Um, but, I, yeah, so I think it's going to be North Carolina. I think it's going to be – I keep going low scores. I'm not going to go low score here. I think I'm going to go – 80, no, 79, 78, game-winning shot by Brady Manick to win the game. North Carolina wins the national title, and everyone just goes nuts in New Orleans. And, yes, if this happens, I'm going to be posting this 40 times over, and I will keep posting it if I get this correct, and especially if I get the game-winner correct. If that happens, Josh, I need you to, like, pay me money or something because that's just – it's the best. I wouldn't be disappointed at all, Ben. I just, I guess I would go with uh, what's been the trend and have Caleb Love being the guy to make that shot. But you no, know, he doesn't get the love from me. He doesn't get I mean, the love from guys me. Guys, all are capable. That's what makes this Tar Heel team so dangerous is that you can't lock up on one guy because RJ Davis could go off, Caleb Love could go off, Baycott could go off, Manic could go off. Yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an epic game. I can't wait to to see what happens. Hope you all are watching. Gonna be watching either tonight or maybe you're watching like you've already watched it and we were completely wrong and Kansas blew them out by 40 and we're all depressed. And then we come on the next week and apologize that could very well happen. So if that happens, uh, we're sorry ahead of time. Um, 
But we talked about, you talked about, you know, lock up. And then there was also a lockout. Oh, there's a sport that had a lockout this year that I never understand the whole thing of lockout. It's too much terminology and I just don't really care. It's just like, let's play baseball type thing. Right. But was major league baseball and Josh it's baseball season this week. It's baseball is back. This week. It didn't look like it was going to happen, Ben. I think when I say that optimistically, I was thinking the season would start in June. Yeah, we both did. We both, I said like late May, you said June and look, here we are. They listen to us, Josh. It proves that Manfred <laughs> listens to the small guys, and he always is looking. And he's all, think, he's always looking out for that. us. He's always looking out for the fans. He cares about the about all the the teams. He cares about the players. It just shows that, Josh. And by the way, I'm being very sarcastic. If you guys right are now. Li- only listening and not watching. Like you should have seen Men's <laughs> face right there. It was definitely <laughs> convincing. Uh, but but in all seriousness manfred needs to go i'm sorry what did i say that sorry sorry um we'll get back on a serious topic because you know uh i can't get by that the the guy is messing up baseball and that's all i'm gonna say um josh baseball is back like i just said like four times have you been watching any spring training have you been keeping up on the guardians i can't uh, about said the indians and sounds so weird to say that it is Still. the guardians just sounds like I'm watching a movie and I don't like it. Yeah. Um, so you have Not the guardians really in particular, but I've been enjoying watching, uh, I guess the highlights that uh, the MLB throws on its Instagram yeah. and stuff like that. So I've gotten a little bit of looks at everybody. I couldn't tell you who's really winning the divisions and stuff. Cause honestly, that doesn't even matter in spring anyway, because they play like 50 or 60 different guys yeah. from all the levels and the starters aren't really playing maybe they're coming in for like one or two at bats so but but we have a big news but a big news at a spring training albert pools his last year is going to be this year reuniting with the cardinals which i think is going to be as a, I mean i hate it because he he's killed the reds his whole career which means literally for a third of the year i have to watch him go to great american ballpark and hit bombers um he's only going to be playing i guess like against lefties as a dh so yeah, really he's only going to be playing right. he's probably only going to play like 30 to 50 games this year um which i can see him doing i mean he is kind of beat up i mean the dude can barely run like on i, I have mlb the show and his speed is one on the game which i think is just really? so funny to me like the, literally running with him is like it's just like it's like a tank that's rolling um yeah so so I'm we have i'm a big fan of, move, ben. I'm a yes, big fan of move. I, I like it when uh guys can i guess go out the right way with maybe where it started with yeah. who all starting with the Cardinals. But I think also too with the pools thing is like Adam Rainwright's probably in his last year and Yadi or Molina to have all those three guys the finish their era. career. And I'll be honest, I love our pools. Like his faith is so strong and he's just such a um an amazing guy. Like if you hear his story and like what he does in his home home country, Dominican Republic, just a really cool guy. Like that makes you love that's what I love about baseball, like hearing these stories of these guys. Um it's really cool. Is so reason is this a reason to like the universal DH Ben? Did this make this possible? You know, I'll be honest, it makes me like it a little bit more, but I'll still be honest with you. I like I just it's just weird for me. Like as a guy that grew up watching the national league, like I love seeing a pitcher that was hitting Oh 14 come up and hit a dinger. <laughs> and then, then the other pitchers ticked off or seeing cologne, right. That, you know, fatty cologne, Bartolo cologne, who, you know, you know, just looks like he doesn't care, swings the bat, hits a home run, you know, and it's, and it's a big thing. Like that's fun for me. Now you're never going to have a pitcher unless they're an amazing hitter. They're not going to hit anymore. And it's just, you know, I get it. It's, I believe this is all from Otani. I really do believe this is part of the reason why this is happening. Cause the guy that's pitching, you know, every five days and then going hitting every, you know, four days a week. I mean, yeah. Otani is going to have 40 home runs because the dude's a freak, but come on. We need the Bronson Royals of the world to go out there and swing a bat and strike out every time. Like that's fun for me to watch. Um, but yeah, that that's besides the point. So Josh, what are, what are your thoughts for the guardians this year? Um, and I'll get my thoughts on the reds and then we'll kind of get our thoughts on some of the award races here. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to refer to them as Cleveland right now because I still hate that name, but <laughs> This is how I kind of see it shaping up, Ben. I think the White Sox are like a legit bona fide World Series contender. So I'm just going to give them division right off the bat. Wow. Yeah. 
I'm really high on the White Sox, and unfortunately, as a as a Cleveland fan, it's not it not very exciting because I hate the White Sox. So, I kind of see the White Sox finishing first, Minnesota and Detroit duking it out for second and third, and then that leaves Cleveland and Kansas City uh, fighting to not be in fifth. I think this is also uh, Cleveland, and I've alluded to this in the past, has slowly been trading away some of its yep. uh, key franchise guys, like Francisco Lindor was the most recent one. And I wouldn't be surprised this year if they send a couple more uh, other guys. Maybe they send Biebs off to another team. Maybe finally they part ways with Jose Ramirez, which would suck because, as you can see behind me, he's one of my favorite players. So that's kind of how I see it. Maybe uh, by the time June rolls around, if this team is – currently in last place maybe they just decide that this is when we fully embrace the rebuild and quit flirting with trying to finish like 81 and 81 or like around 500 and just totally commit to being a 60 and 102 team and just uh finish about with 60 wins the next five years and then accumulate enough draft picks and prospects to be able to run it back for a world series uh run again later down the road but that's kind of how i see cleveland season going how do yeah. you sir see Cincinnati? because it seems like you guys are already ahead of cleveland in terms of rebuilding dude don't even, i hate our i hate our owner like i <laughs> i i have said this my dad has said this too for my dad said this for like three or four years now castellini is a guy that's just like he's like he's the i think pretty sure he's the poorest owner which is not saying i mean they're all rich but like in the sense of like he doesn't have a lot of money so most of what he makes is through the like club like the the club itself so and it's so weird to me because like cincinnati you you've been to cincinnati cincinnati is a is a baseball town you know you can say that's the bengals you can say it's whatever like it's a baseball town it's the oldest franchise in baseball it's been around since the eight, late 1800s. Like this, this is an old team. You know, they have the seventies the and the big red machine and all that. Right. And so it's like, you know, we went through that stretch from 2010 to 2014. We had those amazing runs. We couldn't win playoff games because, well, it's an Ohio team and winning playoff games just doesn't happen if you're from Ohio. Um, <laughs> but then on top of that, you know, then you go into this weird three-year rebuild, but it wasn't a full rebuild. It was like, okay, we'll get rid of our big guys except Joey Votto. Like, I love Joey Votto, but the dude was making $30 million a year. If you wanted to get rid of contract, get rid of Joey Votto when you had the prime real estate to do it. Um, and then, you know, then we had a couple of years here this past couple of years where, you know, we're – we're winning. We're making the playoffs two years during COVID. And then last, um, not last year, but that COVID year, we made the playoffs. And then last year, we're, we're, and I said this last week, or it was a two weeks ago. I said this, we were a, we are a win. We were a player away from the playoffs, maybe two players away from the playoffs. And, um, and to see how the, the reds have kind of just went in the opposite direction and said, Hey, we're going to get rid of, Sonny Gray. Hey, we're going to get rid of Suarez. We're going to get Winker. I know you're trying to save money, but Winker was only making $5 million this year because he was getting arbitration. Then, yeah, Suarez had a big contract. I get it. Get rid of him. That's fine. But Winker was like the heart and soul of like everyone loved Winker around Cincinnati. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what to think, man. I, to predicting the Reds, I would say it's going to probably be – I really think it's going to be the Brewers on top. I, I just think they're – they're gonna they have great pitching staff. They got so many guys yeah. back. I don't think yeah. they lost much of yeah. anything. So it's gonna be the Brewers. I think it's gonna be Brewers. I think you're gonna see the Cardinals. Um, I think with the Albert Pools and those guys going out, like they're gonna they're gonna make the playoffs too. Uh, I think the Cubs are gonna kind of have a, a comeback year, but I don't think all the way back. I think they're still gonna be they're in the third spot. Yeah. They're gonna be a real wild card to watch just because it is the end of the Baez Rizzo uh Bryant stint in Chicago, but it also seems like they're not committing to a rebuild because they spent some money on some guys like Marcus yeah. Strom to come out. Yeah. And play. So I think they'll finish third. And I really think it's going to be a battle between two really bad teams. Like I yeah. looked at this, I'll be honest though. I'm excited to see um, Hunter green play for the reds. He was our for first, sure. uh, first overall pick in 2018. He's had some injury problem with his elbow. He's a two way player. He can be a two way player. They're not sure if they're going to use it, but the dude can throw 104 miles per hour. He did it last year. And I can't wait to see him pitch. He's going to be amazing. Lodolo is another guy I'm looking forward to see pitch. But I'll be honest, this pitching staff is going to get shelled. Like, this pitching staff is going to be bad. Outside of Castillo, 
they're all newbies. Like they have like a combined, like, like it's like a hundred starts or something. It's ridiculous. Like it's, it's so bad. Um, and then the, the offensive side of the ball, like they, okay, no offense to the guys I got, but they got like fam in left field. They have a dude at short, a dude at third base. I've never heard of. They have Moustakis who's played. Moustakis has played. Listen to this. I know you're still playing. This is the thing. They they signed him from from Milwaukee. Milwaukee had a good year. In Milwaukee. They signed him in the last two years. He's been with the team for two years. He's played a total of like sixty games in two years. They're paying him a ton of money. Then you have Joey Votto, who on a good year, Joey Votto hits 300, 400 on base percentage, looks like an all star. And a bad year, he hits two sixty, and who knows what we're gonna get. So I've said this. I think the the Reds will finish above the Pirates just because Pittsburgh's Pittsburgh. Like the pirates are pirates. Like they, they seem to always just find a way to like, just tank so bad. And I've looked at their roster and it's worse than the reds. Like if the reds roster is bad, there's a chance though. I would not be surprised. And I'm going to say this now that you could see the Pittsburgh pirates and reds have one, two picks in the 2023 draft. I would not be shocked. If you see the pirates have number one in Baltimore, I think so. The, the, I, I hate to say this as a reds fan, but I am not, like positive about this season at all. Like I literally think the Reds could have a really, really bad year. And that's because Castellini doesn't want to spend money. They spent yeah. a total of 1.4 million this off season. 1.4 million. Yeah. That's what I they mean, spent. I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think Pittsburgh and Cincinnati are going to be gunning for that first overall pick. I think uh, Baltimore is going to be in there. And I think uh, Oakland as well with yeah. how much they gave up. Yeah. So th- Those that, four are going to be terrible. that's interesting for me. Who, who for you will be the MVP of this baseball? I mean, let's talk, let's stop talking about the, the seller, the seller dwellers that we're going to be talk, we've been talking about, about the guys that make us come to watch the game. Exactly. So who oh. is going to be your MVP for the 2022 season? Oh yeah. Ben, I got, I got predictions for both leagues for Ooh. all the major awards. Yeah. So let's start off. Let's start off in my, Actually, I'll start off in your National League because this will be a little bit quicker. But I like Ronald Acuna, MVP mm. for the National League. And the reason for that is because um, in the shortened 2020 season, he led the league in uh, – or not 2020. It was 2019. He led the league as like a 19-year-old kid in stolen bases and runs scored. 2020 season gets shortened, so we don't really get to see his numbers at full capacity. And then last year, we really see him kind of break out. He gets 24 home runs in the 82 games he played, and then he's hurt for the whole season. But now that Freddie Freeman is out of Atlanta, and now that I think that means that Acuna, like this is his team now, and he's still young. He's only going to be 24 this year. And I think if he can keep Atlanta at the top of the division or contribute to that, get like a 40 home run, 100 RBI season, and even 40 stolen bases, I think those are all things he's capable of doing. This is his MVP award. But there are a couple other guys that I'll say keep an eye on, like Chris Bryant, who's in Colorado now. So that <laughs> means that the home runs are going to go up. But I don't know if that's going to translate to team success in Colorado. And I think that is somewhat not super important like the other leagues, but somewhat important for winning the MLB MVP. But in Colorado, I mean, they're in a really hard division. They're not even like a terrible team. They're just in a really hard division where it's going to be tough to win. And then I think uh, Juan Soto, you got to include him in the mix with how young and what a monster he is. And then Bryce Harper has, I mean, it looks like he found his swing back then last year. It looked like he did. He paid him too much money. People were saying with uh, him hitting like 260 back to back seasons in Philly. But last year, I mean, he was an MVP running. But if I had to, uh, had a gun in my head right now, I'd predict Ronald Acuna MVP in Atlanta. Uh, I that's a great solid pick, Josh, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going to go. I, I had Ronald Cunha in my final. He's in my top three, like my top three choices. Okay. But my number one is going to be Fernando Tatis. I mean, how could really? you not forget? Even though he's going to miss a few weeks or months with that this, injury. This is what I'll say. I, I have said Fernando Tatis with a caveat. This is the, you didn't let me finish, Josh. You you cut me off. Okay. I didn't Fernando think he was ca- game to even can seriously be considered. No. But so I, caveat: if if he can come back before, let's say May, midway through May, June before June, because we've seen guys win the MVP when they get right before June, right at June spot, they have a a tear it when they you know they just tear the cover off the ball. I don't think it's going to happen, so I'm not choosing him. Um, I was just setting you up there because you decided to cut me off. You tricked me, Ben. I thought you were going to like – 
I was trying to set up my bit. No, uh, I'm actually gonna go. I'm actually gonna go a little bit outside the box. You mentioned him. I'm gonna go Juan Soto. Okay. Juan Soto for me, I think he's a guy that he's kind of under the radar because you have all these big names in the NL of like guys. I just think people don't think of him sometimes. They just kind of forget about Juan Soto just sitting out there in DC, you know, doing his thing. Um, I think it's a it's a division. It's it's a league that in National League that he could do really well in. Um, I, I do think Juan Soto has the, what it is to make you know MVP. I think second, I agree with you. Bryce Harper for me is second. I think Bryce Harper has found the old Bryce Harper that is terrifying to face because the man has a swing that looks like he could kill somebody with. Uh, that that whole uppercut swing is just a beautiful thing to watch, but it's also terrifying. Um, and then thirdly, I have Ronald Cunha. I agree with you about the stolen bases, everything like that. I think if he's healthy, if he's healthy, that's the one thing with right. him. If he stays yeah, healthy, he's going to do. That's one thing about Juan Soto. I feel like he's going to stay healthy the same way Bryce Harper, hopefully as well. Um, so yeah, th those are mine uh, for the NL, Josh. All right. Moving over to the American league. Now uh, this will be maybe a little bit more of a discussion, but yeah. so I'm going to preface this with a couple guys that I think will be in the running and then I'll tell you who I think. Okay. Will be. So I'm just going to throw out Corey Seager first as a guy to keep an eye on mm -hmm. new guy out in Texas. I know the Rangers finished last in the division last year, so they spent a ton of money as a result. I think they spent like maybe yeah, they spent a lot of money and money spent, spent this offseason. Of and most of it was on this man, and I think he's going to deliver. Most of the guys at Texas, I was looking through like they whenever they make a big splash in free agency with a big bat, like say an Adrian Beltre or a Josh Hamilton and Alex Rodriguez, like it usually turns out pretty well for them. So I don't know yeah. if it's just a hitter friendly park or if it's just like warm weather year round helps the guys out. But I think Corey Seager is going to continue that trend. He's not like maybe the big power hitter that those guys are that he named, but he does have some pop to his bat. I think he could hit, you know, 30 home runs, not super hard to do anymore. He's a great contact hitter. He'll hit high for average. Um, and if he can make Texas like finish in the middle of that division or maybe like around 500, I think that'll uh, help his case for MVP in the American League. The other guy that I'll throw out, I think you got to mention Vladimir Guerrero Jr. With the mm -hmm. way that he broke out last year onto the scene, he's 20 pounds lighter He's this year freak. that's going to make him a little bit more athletic maybe on the defensive side of things maybe it'll make him faster and he can maybe leg out some more doubles maybe yeah. get a couple more stolen bases but the guy i gotta go with ben until i see otherwise is shohei otani i think he's you know he's not the best pitcher in the league he's not the best hitter in the league but he's good at both of them and he can do both we don't see two-way players like this Here, ever hold on i'll stop you okay. most valuable player what is that supposed to stand for that's all i'm to say i'll let you finish right. but I'm, I'm just kind of prefacing it like you know he's not the best hitter he's not the best yeah. pitcher but the fact that he can do both at a high level it's like okay if this is the reason he's winning mvp that means that he's going to continue to win mvp until he's not one a good hitter or a good pitcher yeah. right or until he stops doing one or the other and it's like, are we going to see Shohei Otani like come out and win five straight MVPs because of this? Or will the voters, like in almost any other sport, get tired of giving it to him, Ben? Do you think that Shohei will fall off talent-wise first? Or do you think the voters will get bored of giving it to him over I, all the like, other young, talented guys all the time? I think, first off, I will say that that's who my pick is, too. I think Shohei Otani is going to win this year. And I'll say this, it could end up being like a LeBron situation where they just don't give it to him after two or three years. And they're like, yeah, we're going to, even though LeBron, we've said it, I've heard it said a thousand times. He deserves it every single year for what he does throughout the game on an impact basis. I look at Shohei Otani. I'm like, how can you tell me that if a guy's hitting 40 home runs, hundred RBIs throws with like a three ERA, tell me how that man does not deserve the MVP every single year. There's right. no argument you can make with me that says, Oh, someone that hits 45 home runs and 130 RBIs is better than him. How? He didn't pitch. Like this dude is pitching once a, once every five days, and then every other time he's going out there to hit. That's impressive. Like it's I incredible. was a pitcher. I was a pitcher. I sucked at hitting. Like that's the thing. Is like it's either you're either good at one or you're you're either bad at both, <laughs> either or yeah. you're good at one. There's not many like you're good at both. And so, to me. I said it could get close with Vlad Jr. I think Vlad Jr. can make it close just because the dude's a freak as well. I mean, the guy is built like a, a freaking trunk. I mean, the dude is just stronger than an ox. 
but I, I just look at Shohei Otani and like the, what he did last year and the way he gets the fans behind him, the MLB cannot choose a guy that the fan, like if the fans are like, why did you choose him? Then, okay, then yeah, change it. But the fans love Shohei Otani. He's a weird freakish kind of player that we've never seen before since Babe Ruth. The last time we saw a player like this was Babe Ruth. We're literally witnessing a 21st century version of Babe Ruth. And he's Japanese. Like it's that, that's, yeah. that's just, that's what's so cool. And I, and I yeah. so yeah, that's what I would say for my MVP is Shohei just to, Otani. Just to kind of wrap that up. I think the annoying thing, if you're like a fan of another player, like if you're a Blue Jays fan, you want to see Vlad win MVP. It's like, well, Shohei, if he was just a hitter, I don't think he'd be winning MVP. And if he was just a pitcher, I don't think he'd be winning Cy Youngs. Yeah. But it's just the fact that he can do both at uh, the high level that he does it combined is just, it's like, it's really tough to argue against. Yeah, it's like most valuable player. That's what I was always told as a kid, right, growing up. What's most valuable to your team? And the guy that can do both is most valuable player. So, so we, both, we both think Shohei yes. is, the, is the front runner. Do you have any other guys in that mix? <sighs> I was trying to think this through and, and try to really think who could who could it be? Um. <laughs> Again, I, I said Vlad Jr. I think he's up there. I think you have like I agree with you about Seeger. Like he's another guy that's that's up there. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I really have another guy. Like I just I guess I was so fixated on Shohei and Vlad that it's really hard for me to pick. So I mean, you guys talk about Mike Trout, Ben. That's a name we haven't even said yet. But again, with Mike Trout, is is he going to be healthy? <laughs> It's super hard for me to put him in the conversation when the dude plays twenty five games and he yeah. breaks his wrist. Yeah. You know, like, again, I think he could be up there. Don't get me wrong, but the man's always hurt, feels like, For the sure. last few years. So, yeah. One other one other maybe dark horse that I'll throw out here. Uh, what would you think about uh, Javi Baez in Detroit? No. No. Absolutely no chance. It's Detroit. I don't believe anybody, that, <laughs> unless you're Miguel Cabrera, I don't believe anybody in Detroit has a shot at winning MVP. Okay. I mean, That's I don't I'm I would, say. I would, I didn't mention Javi and mine either. I'm just thinking of like other names out in the American League that uh, not, might be intriguing to some guys. I would I would put Trevor Story at Boston over him, 100. percent That I is just, right. Trevor Story is out at Boston. Now. I just don't see how someone in Detroit, how someone in Detroit can win an MVP. Like I'm sorry because there's I have friends in Detroit, but I'm just being honest. Like <laughs> it's like someone for the Reds winning MVP. Joey Votto winning it was a, like a rare thing for us. Yeah, I mean, no one ever wins it. When we were kids. I believe Maglu Ordonez won an MVP. Miguel Cabrera won MVP. Not so won I like what you said, like when we were kids. So that's what I want right. to point out. Like that was when Detroit was contending for World Series, though. Yeah. So it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah. a while. So yeah, so that's who we have for the MVP, Josh. Yeah, moving over to some Cy Youngs now. Um, mm. We'll stick in the American League for now with this one. Uh, I don't have Shohei Otani on my Cy Young candidates. Maybe he should be. Maybe you have a convincing argument, Ben. But I'm going to go with Shane Bieber right now, who won the Cy Young in 2020 in the shortened season. He led the league in wins, ERA strikeouts, so pitching triple crown seemed like a no-brainer, right? Comes back in 2021, has a shortened season again, not because of COVID, but because of an injury. So I think now he's going to come back in 2022, uh, back to health, back to full form. He was pitching well last year. He was 7-4, 317 ERA before he had to be shut down permanently. So... I really like Shane to come back and uh, contend for another uh, Cy Young this year. And maybe I'm also a little biased being a Cleveland fan, and I want something well, to cheer for. I mean, for he's gonna in he's gonna get traded, so. <laughs> but maybe he'll be traded within the American League, and he can still win the American League Cy. So, so you, so you have, so you have Bieber. What, what is, what? Is, so that's who you think is gonna win the Cy Young, and then who, who that's are some Cy Young out in the American League? Yes. So, who, who, who are some of your other candidates in there? Yeah. Um, Let's think about that right now, because honestly, Bieber was the first one that came to my mind. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I'll I'll throw one out out there. I'll throw one out there to you. Let's hear it. Uh, So this is, I'll give you a little bit of hint on on what mine is. All right. So mine for me is I have, I do have Otani in my top, like look out for like dark horses. I think if Otani has a really like, just if he goes, let's say if Otani goes 13 and four and has an ERA of like 280. Right. And then he also is hitting like crazy too. There's a chance he could win MVP in Cy Young. I, I, I wouldn't put it past it. But again, I just don't think Otani hasn't, I don't think there's enough focus in there to really do um, 
you know, have that opportunity. But my guy that I was going to suggest that I think is going to win the Cy Young, and this is just me, is Garrett Cole from New- the New York Yankees, mm-hmm. an old Pittsburgh Pirate legend that, you know, got out of that, you know, crap hole and and moved on up to, you know, New York. Um, so Garrett Cole is is my choice for Ale uh, Cy Young. Uh, again, I do have um, Bieber up there as well. Another guy is Ray from um, Toronto. Robbie, Ray. Uh, Robbie yeah. Ray is another guy that I have. So those are like my top four uh, guys. So I have Garrett Cole winning the AL Cy Young in, yeah. in the AL. And then just some of the other guys that I guess uh, were some of the stat leaders last year uh, to keep an eye on again, uh, Lance McCullers. That's another one. Yeah. Uh, I believe Tyler Glass. Now we don't talk about Houston though. No one, no one should win anything in Houston. We don't think they deserve anything. No, I am with you. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess Tyler Glass now, too, is another one from uh, – I think he's still in Tampa Bay. Yeah, Tampa Bay, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be another one that I'd say to keep an eye on. But uh, I'll flip it over to the National League now with uh, Mike Cy Young. This was a lot more difficult for me to pick then because I feel like all of the – Yeah, I would agree with you on that one, yeah. Right now are National League. But I'm going to uh, go with Walker Bueller. Ooh, now that uh, – okay. I mean, it, I think he's more of the clear-cut ace – on Los Angeles' staff with uh, Scherzer being gone, with Kershaw being a little bit older. And Bueller was third in the league last year in ERA and wins. Uh, so I think this year is the year that he solidifies himself as the Dodgers' ace, clear-cut guy, and is going to uh, – especially with DeGrom uh, being hurt. And Scherzer mm-hmm. also, now with the Mets, uh, dealing with uh, – I don't know if his injuries is serious. I know he's going to miss a little and, bit. And Trevor, and Trevor Bauer with the unknown of him too, with the whole legal right. situation with him. That's another one. Right. That it looks like he's going to get like uh, okay off of that in terms of like, I guess, convictions and things like that. But you still don't know when uh, the Dodgers are going to bring him back or if the MLB will throw down a suspension or anything. But I think, uh, I think Walker Bueller has a great shot to win it. I, I, I'm with you. Walker Bueller, I have his number three on my list. Uh, number one, I actually have Corbin Burns from Milwaukee. I talked about them having a loaded pitching staff. I think Corbin Burns, he went 11 and five. So he didn't have many wins, but that was a weird Milwaukee team where they like didn't score many runs till late in the game. It was like a really weird thing. Um, but he, he had a 243 ERA, led the National League and struck out 234 batters. So the guy is still young. Like he's only 27. He's so he's still kind of like in his prime. So I think Corbin Burns, but another guy that I'm going to throw out there that led the national league in wins plays for that Dodgers team with Kershaw, with Bueller, with, with all those guys is Julio uh, Urias, who yeah. believe it or not, remember once was a very highly coveted prospect who went through some rough times, came up, got shellacked, Went to the bullpen, got His shellacked. First start was not good. Yeah, and so he had a really rough time. He's he's 25, and he's going to be turning 26. He had 20 wins last year, 296 ERA. He's a lefty, so I think again with Kershaw, seemingly I hate to say this about Kershaw, but he's kind of on the downward trajectory. He's yeah. not the same Kershaw. I mean, again, Kershaw is one of the best ever. I mean, he has well, a, be- a good pitcher, but he has I mean, be- not the Clayton we've seen. Let me just put it this way. Kershaw has a below career three ERA. That is unheard of for a National League pitcher. That is very hard to do. <laughs> that is hard to do. I think Urias is going to prove to be a, a difference maker for the Dodgers this year, especially if Bauer is missing some time. So that's who I have. It um, could be either one of those two guys. I'm, I'm yeah. not going to argue that pick either. That's another guy I think you got to throw in the mix. Maybe he's the guy that stands out as the clear cut ace of the Dodgers. Yep. The so too. Burns for me as the AL or sorry, NL. So, you know. Yeah. And speaking, since you brought up uh, Urias from the Dodgers, I want to stick with uh, highly touted pitching prospects and move to National League Rookie of the Year, who I think, the clear-cut favorite has to be Hunter Green, right, Ben? Is oh, there yeah, for me, hundred percent. That I mean, could. I, I mean, I'll be honest. The hard part. The hard part about Rookie of the Year is this: is because we don't know who's going to be stuck on that major league roster right away. I mean, they could be said they're going to be on the roster, and then three weeks later they send them down because the whole days and year thing that right. messes they up might the service. Bring them up later in June, to, so that they yeah. can like manipulate the rookie contract or something. I like would that. say if you look at Jonathan India for the Reds that won it last year. He was a guy that started really slow. He hit like 195 for the first month of the year. And everyone's like, oh, this is a wash up second baseman. Turns out to be pretty much the best player on the team last year. Um, and he, so he won it. I just think Hunter Green has a chance to win it because 
everyone's eyes are going to be on a guy that throws 104 miles per hour. And to be honest, he could be the number three or number two guy by the end of the year on this team. If they trade away Castillo and they trade away some of these guys, he could be the, the true foundation to, to the bridge for the future. So I'm going to, I'm just going to say, because I'm biased and you said about North Carolina, I'm going to say about the reds. It's going to be Hunter green. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, uh, a lot of these guys that end up getting like super highly touted, like as pitching prospects, like think about guys like Steven Strasburg or yeah. even Marias or even a role Chapman a while back when he was coming up, we knew how hard he could throw. Like maybe they don't pan out necessarily that rookie season, but it seems like they are destined to have great careers. There's not too many guys yeah. that get hyped up as pitchers like this, that flop. Yeah. So I, I like Hunter green though, as rookie of the year out in the American league. Um, what seemed like a slam dunk last year, Randy Rosarena ended up winning it. Like that's kind of how I feel about Hunter Green. Yeah. But Nash or not National League, American League. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, Spencer Torkelson, who is going to be Dude, first base. For we the are on, we are on fire today, Josh. Detroit. We are on fire today because I was that's like what another, I was gonna say too. This seems like another slam dunk right now. He made the opening day roster, so we know he's gonna play, and he's gonna play over at first. I think Miggy is gonna switch over to DH or like a lesser role out there in Detroit, but 2020 or 2020 first overall pick. He's been hitting bombs at Arizona state. He's been hitting bombs at the minors two years later after getting drafted. He's already up at the pros. Like, I think this is uh, another clear cut favorite in my opinion for rookie of the year. I, I'm sorry, Detroit fans. The only thing you'll win this year is a rookie of the year. I'm sorry. I apologize. Right. <laughs> no, but that's, that's who I have too. I think a guy that comes two years after getting drafted. Yeah. The dude's going to win rookie of the year. If he's already up this fast, he's going to win the rookie of the year. To pretty much sell sort. That's why I got. That's all I gotta say. Yeah, it's Detroit. And then the last award that I got, Ben, uh, that I thought about was Manager of the Year. I don't know if there's any more like Comeback Player of the Year that you want to talk about after this, but Manager of the Year out in the National League. Uh, I'm gonna go with a first year coach of the Padres, Bob Melvin. He's a guy Ooh. that's won Manager of the Year before, and he's done it with teams like Oakland and Arizona and like all these small market like teams with no firepower that just kind of win uh based on like you know the money ball strategy and now he's going to be with the Padres who are a team that has been spending a lot of money had a late season collapse last year which is why they fired their manager last year in the first place I'm excited to see what Melvin can do with like actual superstar players like Eric Hosmer and Fernando Tatis once he is healthy and back in the lineup again uh so I'm gonna go with Melvin out there in the National League you know that's a that's a pick that I'm not I'm not shocked about because it it makes sense because the Padres are one of those teams I think that need that needed they just need a better manager. I'm actually gonna go with Joe Girardi. Yes. I I think the Phillies are a team that's on the cusp. I really do. I I, I think they are building up out there. That's yes. just such a hard division that they're in. Yes, but Similar I believe it's Padres with NL West. I, I think Joe Girardi is gonna be the guy. So that's who I got, Joe Girardi in the National League. Yeah. So is that assuming that Philly is going to win that NL East division? I, I think well? that I think they will. That's that's just my opinion. I think they will. I think it could go. I think it could go a lot of ways, but I, I believe that they they could be the best in there, especially in the offensive end. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of people would probably pick the Braves to repeat again, just because they they I mean they did lose Freddie, but they replaced him with Matt Olson, who's a capable first baseman. They add Kenley Jansen. They're gonna have Ronald Acuna healthy. Uh, the Mets, I would like better if they could show better run support for guys like DeGrom. But I think that it's going to be that race between Philly and Atlanta. That's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, it will be. It'll be, it'll be great. In the NL West, I don't know if the Giants will repeat the success they had last mm -hmm. year. That kind of seemed like a surprise. So I think this might be Padres versus Dodgers. And that could determine whether Bob is uh, manager out right there. Good old Bob. <laughs> Good old Bob. But uh, American League manager of the year. I already told you how highly I think of the White Sox this year, and I'm going to go with Tony La Russa uh, as manager of the year out in the American League. He's kind of been a part of this uh, come up that the White Sox have been having lately, and I think this might be uh, that season that they put it all together. And he, the other thing that I like about La Russa, I could be wrong about this. Hopefully I don't get cooked in the comments for a terrible take, but when you see managers like Dave Roberts who run everything based on analytics when they have the – biggest payroll and the most superstars and he screws his team out of winning world series championships because he decides to do stuff wild like sit out all his left-handed batters 
some of them being all-stars just because a lefty's on the mound pitching that night. It's like, you got to rely on these superstar guys. And I think La Russa does that with his guys. He's a little bit more old school. I don't think he's as analytically driven. That's why I can't stand seeing guys like Roberts win managers of the year even be talked about because it's like he's benefiting so much from having all-star talent and money and he's finding ways to lose games like he should be winning more than what he is over there and I think La Russa is the opposite of that I think that's one of the reasons why he's going to be successful yeah I, I would agree with that one actually mine's gonna be uh not a similar situation but mine's gonna be Chris Woodward down in uh te- down in for Texas Texas Rangers manager I think he's a guy that you like you said they spent a lot of money a lot of money man this is a make or break like i think if he loses he'll get fired but if he does a great year i think this could be like he could be the guy that runs away with the the award because you take a team that was really bad last year to a team that's really good and you you did it doing the right way so i have chris woodward as the manager of the year for the al it's going to be a crazy year. And so, Josh, to finish this up, this talk about baseball, who is your World Series pick for this season? That's what we're going to finish on. Before the, the whole season starts, we got to put that out there. That's a tough one, man. Ah, uh, Gosh, I, I feel like everybody always wants to say the – the current champion is going to repeat, right? Like Atlanta's probably a popular pick, but it's just so hard to do. The Dodgers got better. Um, I really like the White Sox, as I've told you. Um, I think that Tampa Bay is going to continue to be good. I think you got to watch out for New York, Yankees. Um, but for now, I'm going to roll with the Dodgers. <laughs> I just think that there's the lineup is just – Filled with too many all-stars. And as long as Dave Roberts doesn't screw up, they can win it. Like a lineup with Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman and Cody Bellinger and Justin Turner and Max Muncy and Will Smith and a rotation with Urias and potentially Bauer. They're going to have Bueller. They're going to have Kershaw. Like it's going to be very hard to beat that team, Ben. On paper, it's going to be very hard to beat the Dodgers. I don't, I I also kind of subconsciously think that there's somebody that's going to come out and surprise us. I just haven't done enough homework yet to know who that is. So I'm just going to go with what feels comfortable, but not cliche by picking the Braves to repeat. And I'm going to go with the Dodgers. You know, what's so funny is that I go for the unpredictable. You know what I said last week? I said, North Carolina was going to win, you know, and they, and they won, right? I want to stick in LA, but I ain't choosing the Dodgers. I'm going Los Angeles angels. And there's just something about if Mike Trout is healthy, you got Shohei Otani. You have some of these younger players. You have yeah, Anthony Rendon. Re- Anthony Rendon. You have some pitchers. Their pitching staff can do some work, use some work. They got my man Michael Lorenzen, a former Red, who I loved and adored as a Red. A lot of pitchers, too, the last and couple of drafts. All I'm going to say is don't mess with Shohei Otani. And this Angels team, who's probably going to be doubted, I haven't said anything about it because I've been waiting for this moment, but I'm thinking <laughs> LA Angels beat the LA Dodgers in the world series i think it would be the greatest thing to have two la teams battle out for the world series and i think the angels are going to win it all we know that this now. Corporate mlb Say wants that to happen too because big market versus big market man all i'm going to say is one of the rams to win a super bowl so bad they pushed the rams down everyone's throats once they moved from st louis to la they got the new rebrand with the jerseys they're spending all this money i think that mlb would love to have that too in la la all i'm saying is is that I think it's going to happen. Now, I'm just saying in a year's time, if I'm talking about this and how amazing I was right, then awesome. But I also could be completely wrong and they could be bottom dwellers. I don't know. So I, I'm going to go ahead and throw out a team that I think the Dodgers will beat too because you were able to put in American League National League. I'm going to say the Dodgers will beat the White Sox. I'll go ahead and fully commit to that White Sox pick and say that they're coming out of the AL. And that is how we talk about baseball and basketball. I briefly want to say that we we were really going to mention about the uh, USA soccer team making it to the World Cup, but we both realized that we we're both so inadequately uh, prepared to talk about anything that is soccer. So we decided to wait to maybe get, you know, my brother on or somebody that can actually talk the sport more than just me or you that 
just or you or I, however we want to put it. But anyways, I hope you all learned something that Ben Bowden is always correct. Um, his predictions always come true. Um, and that Jamie Dodane is always wrong. Um, sorry, Jodane. Sorry, Jamie. I'm sorry. I was told not to do this by Josh, but I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I've been nicer to you, Jamie. Well, you haven't been here to defend yourself. I want you, I hope you acknowledge that. <laughs> I'm sure she will. Um, and this will not be posted on Instagram, this part, like I normally do. Um, but anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode of the podcast. If you loved it on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. You can see all of our old podcast episodes. So recently we've done some really cool ones. We did one with Jamie. We've done, I did one with Aaron. Josh and I have had mock drafts that are now completely to shreds. Um, but yeah, so next week we'll we'll recap the national title game. We'll talk about some other things that are going on. And then in a couple of weeks, it'll be the NFL draft. So we're going to get ready for that. I mean, we're just going to be, we're going to be rocking and rolling with all this here coming up really soon. So uh, once again, thank you so much for listening uh, and we'll see you next time. 